I, t I call this message this evening, How To. <laughs> it's a how-to message. I watch a lot of how-to videos on YouTube, and um, someone said that there is a, um, there's, one of you here, I think, told me this originally, and I'm going to get it wrong. I had this certificate of YouTube University or something. I can't who. What was that? Do you, who is anybody here? Was it somebody here that told me that that I was certified? <laughs> All right, apparently not, or you don't want to admit it. But there's a lot of how-to videos, do-it-yourself videos on YouTube, and I'm not somebody that if I read about it that I can see, that I can do it necessarily. It might be a manual that explains it, but if I can see somebody doing it, I can pick it up, uh, you know, especially if I have the ability to ask somebody a question. But if I can watch them do it, I had a guy come out to the house. He was talking to me about uh, wiring lights. And I said, well, and he offered to help me. I said, well, I said, if you come out and you show me one, I said, that'll, that'll be, if, if you do that, I can take the rest of them and, and do it. Because if I see it happening, and I have, um, I, well, I've learned how to dress, uh, dress a wild turkey by YouTube video, and uh, how to skin a squirrel on YouTube. Uh, most recently, I, I watched a, uh, I was doing some repairs, trying to do some repairs on my, my gear blind, and I was going to, I was going to put some metal snaps, uh, you know, the grommets inside them and all of that, and so uh, I didn't, I've never done that, so I watched YouTube videos. It's a how-to. It's a great resource. If you've never tried that, I would encourage you. Uh, you might be surprised at what's on there. I, I've been surprised. You know, when I've, when I've Googled something to find out how to do something, and lo and behold, somebody has put a YouTube video up there. The book of Proverbs is kind of God's how-to manual, and it covers just so many areas of life. And I hope you've gotten a little bit of an appreciation of that as we move through this book. And this evening, what I want to look at, uh, the verses I would want to look at, would be verses 20 to 23. We're just going to take these. And these, this little section here, as with a lot of Proverbs, is their how-tos. And in verse 20 especially, it talks about how to treat a heavy heart. How to treat a heavy heart. Verse 20. As he that taketh away a garment in cold weather, and as vinegar upon nitre, so is he that singeth songs to a heavy heart. A heavy heart is a normal part of the human experience. At some point, if, you, if it's not happened to you already, you are going to have a heavy heart. You are going to experience some kind of loss in some way. Uh, we don't know, you know, no one can predict what that might be. I, uh, little did I think that I would lose both my parents within a matter of four, four and a half months. Uh, but they passed away within that, that close of our proximity to one another. Um, the heavy heart is part of human existence. The Bible talks about Jesus wept. John chapter 11, verse 35, the shortest verse in the Bible. The only verse that some people have ever memorized. Because it's the shortest one. So it's an easy one. But even that verse is loaded with meaning. The fact is that verse was written on the heels of loss and um, the Lord's empathy for uh, some people. And the Bible acknowledges that even for believers, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, he says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, meaning those who have died, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. So he doesn't say that you don't sorrow at all, but you don't sorrow like people who don't have any hope at all. And I've seen people sorrowing with no hope of ever seeing their loved one again. And that is a, that is a hard, hard reality. Um, 
thank God there's coming a time for us when there is no more grieving. There's no more tears. There's no more weeping. Um, but in this world, there is certainly that. Um, I think it was Matthew Henry who wrote many years ago, there will be no sorrow in heaven, not one single tear shed within the courts above. There will be no more disease or weakness and decay. The coffin and the funeral and the grave and the dark black mourning shall be things unknown. Our faces shall no more be pale and sad. No more shall we go out from the company of those we love and be parted asunder. The word farewell shall never be heard again. That's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, promise that we have in Christ. But it is a fact. <clears throat> It is an undeniable fact that loss is a part of life. We're not going to escape that. And you will encounter people who have experienced perhaps even very grievous uh, loss. And people sometimes make the attempt at cheering up those folks or trying to be a comfort to those folks, and they fail horribly. And this is what this passage in Scripture is addressing. Um, someone said misguided attempts to comfort are perhaps even worse than a lack of comfort. And he, he said Job's comforters are the classic examples. His acquaintances, you know, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him and set out from their homes and met together to try to comfort him. But if you've read the book of Job, they, they didn't do a very good job of being comforters. They kind of blew it. In fact, Job, Job says to them, miserable comforters are you all. You're all a bunch of failures. But any loss can cause a heavy heart. Loss of a loved one, loss of a pet. I, many years ago, I had a guy come in and he was just devastated. And he had lost his dog, and um, he, he said to me, he, um, he said, well, I shouldn't feel this way. I said, why? Why shouldn't you feel that way? If, if Nathan used the illustration of a little lamb that had belonged to a guy that was near to him as his own child, and that s somebody came and took that lamb and, and, and dressed it for somebody for his supper, Nathan used that love for an animal in that way. I said, they, they become very close to us. And I said, you don't have to feel guilty that you are feeling bad because of that. Any loss, a loss of even a treasured possession that has sentimental value. I recall my brother and I getting into a fight. And uh, he was several years older than I, and, and, um, but we would fight. And one time he took a, there was, it was a little toy, one of those little toy metal tractors that were quite heavy. They, it wasn't plastic, it was heavy. And he took the wheel off of that thing, which was mostly metal. And I had run up the stairs, and he was down at the base of the stair, and he took that thing and, whoop, you know, he threw it at me. Well, I dodged that, and it hit a mirror behind me at the top of the stairs, a mirror that was given to my mom and dad on the day that they got married. And mom, my, I, I can still recall, this has, been, this has been decades and decades ago, I can still recall my mom coming around the corner and looking up, and that mirror was shattered. And I remember the tears coming down her face. And, um, but it was something that had a memory attached to it. People can lose friends. So we get attached to people and things and places, and their loss can cause a heavy, heavy heart. It's part of life. And then what makes it worse is when someone who is insensitive or just ignorant try, it, it treats a heavy heart lightly. And hence the verses here. Notice what it says. As he that taketh away a garment in cold weather and as vinegar upon nitre, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, so is he that singeth songs to a heavy heart. You and I need to be sensitive to heavy hearts. 
And one thing that we don't want to do if somebody's got a heavy heart is to aggravate the sorrowful situation. He that taketh away a garment in cold weather. Can you imagine being outside in, Mich in a Michigan winter or a northeast Indiana winter? Okay. Um, and someone coming up to you and taking away your coat. It's already cold. And then they've come and they took away your coat. Or it uses the illustration, or is he that pours vinegar upon niter? You, you know what niter is? Uh, it's essentially it's baking soda, bicarbonate, bicarbonate of soda. And uh, niter was used, it's, actually it's more of an English old English word, but baking soda and niter are the same thing, bicarbonate of soda. And if you want to see what he's talking about, you take some vinegar, right, and take some baking soda and just put it together. And it'll start fizzing and there's, you know, shh, you know, and a foam and there's a reaction to it. Um, violent chemical reaction. I looked up the origin or excuse, uh, on, I looked up online the reaction of vinegar and niter. And here's, I'm quoting here, when, when vinegar and baking soda are first mixed together, hydrogen ions in the vinegar react with the sodium and bicarbonate ions in the baking soda. The result of this initial reaction is two new chemicals, carbonic acid and sodium acetate. The second reaction is a decomposition reaction. Now, I have no idea what I just said to you. <laughs> <coughs> and I haven't got a clue. But um, I can testify that I have witnessed the reaction between vinegar and baking soda or niter. What he is saying here is that this person that singeth songs to a heavy heart is not helping at all. In fact, the reaction is negative. And what he is telling the, the reader here, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, is do not make, don't, don't minimize this person's pain by doing something that's going to make it worse. Don't sing songs to a heavy heart. It's like taking away a person's coat in cold weather or pouring vinegar on soda. There will be a negative reaction. It's not helping. Why? Why isn't singing songs to a heavy heart? Because it is assu it's assuming that the pain will be taken away by some distraction or by some entertainment. Notice the scripture says singing songs as an example. It uses that. And the idea is making a pathetic attempt to entertain them. When that's not going to help at all, it's just going to make them more unhappy. The idea is ignoring their pain and minimizing of their loss by thinking that some distraction, like a cheerful song, will make it better. Or trying to get you to trying to get you to join along. You know, can you imagine grieving over some horrendous loss and someone comes up to you and say, Okay now, come on, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Can you imagine if you were hurting and somebody came up to you and, and they thought that all you needed, excuse me, all you need was just to sing some light songs. Just, just a few cheerful ditties that were going to snap you right out of it. It shows that, no, number one, they do not understand your suffering. And secondly, they think something as frivolous and light as that is, is going to snap you out of it, which means they have no idea of the pain you're in, nor have they thought about it. This is, this is the illustration here. Now, there are certain things that we need to not do in reference to somebody who's hurting. For one thing, don't decide for someone else how they should grieve. Everybody grieves differently. Um, some people are affected in different ways depending on their personality and the circumstances of their loss. Don't decide for someone else how long they should grieve. A widower is not over obligated to get over his wife in six months or six years. In fact, probably never. It, it, it's, it's, 
They can, they can do it in their own time. Don't decide for someone else how they should grieve and how long they should grieve. Let me give you an example. There was a lady, this is almost 40 years ago now, I'm still in touch with her daughter um, all of these years from our church back in Burnham. Um, it's a remarkable story, I won't go into the story, but I, uh, I was able to minister to her, her husband who was dying of cancer. And uh, I would go by uh, frequently and you know, pray with him, visit with him during the course of his decline. Uh, they knew he was going to die. Uh, in fact, I was his hospice um, counselor. And so um, the long and the short of the story was is that it was six, eight months from the time that he was diagnosed to the time that he died. At the funeral, and then at the end of this I did the funeral, and at the funeral uh, the, the daughter whom we, with, with whom we are still maintained in contact was all broken up. She, she would see dad occasionally. She would come back from college and she would see him every, every few months. Um, and she was just beside herself with, with tears. But his wife was not. And she was standing there and I'm, I'm, I am, uh, the wife was here, I, was, I am here, Don, uh, the Donna, the, the daughter was here. And there was a relative that came up and she, and she took the daughter in her arms, she said, there, 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 Donna, you're acting the way your mother should be. I mean, she said it that loud. She said it to be heard. And I just, I was ticked. <laughs> I was, I was very unhappy, but that's not, you know, that's not the time to set somebody in their place. And so, I wrote the wife uh, a note, and I sent it to her in the mail. And I, among other things, I said, I heard what this person said in front of you. And I said, what happens when someone is, is with their, uh, what often happens when someone is with a dying loved one, that the grieving happens before. The acceptance that they are in the, of the loss happens over a period of months, it's not that they don't love this person, but they have already gone through a lot of the grieving process. And she wrote me back a very nice note. She goes, thank you, because I was wondering why I wasn't feeling what I thought I should be feeling. Listen, people handle grief in their own way. Don't tell somebody how they should grieve or how long they should grieve. Or, and don't insinuate <laughs> uh, that it was the deceased's fault that they died. You know, someone's in, a, someone's in a car wreck. You don't ask their loved ones, well, was he wearing a seatbelt? Don't ask that question. You know what that implies? He's at fault. If he had a seatbelt on, he wouldn't have died. The dummy. That's, that is the suggestion with that question. Or if they'd only taken better care of themselves. Again, you're implying that they're dead because it's their fault. Which, you know what, maybe there might be truth in that, but that is not the thing to say. They should have gone to the doctor when they first realized they didn't feel well. Well, okay, maybe. But that's not the thing to say, because the blame is being put on that person that's departed. Don't imply that they are weak and ungrateful. Pretty much any comment that begins with at least is one that you should avoid. And by that I mean, well, at least you have other children. At least you are still young and can find another husband. At least your dad is still alive. At least it wasn't a plane crash and you got to say goodbye. The idea is, is that, well, this could be worse. You know, you should be grateful that it wasn't worse than what it is. People do not think sometimes when they say what they say. So don't imply that they are weak or ungrateful. Um, 
But do sympathize and empathize. Do sympathize and empathize. You know what Romans chapter 12 says? Uh, let's, why don't we turn there? Turn to Romans chapter 12. I want you to see what God says here. Romans chapter 12 and verse 15 says this, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and most of you can quote the rest, and weep with those that weep. You know what that means? You empathize and you sympathize with people. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and reap and weep with those that weep. Don't pretend that everything is fine is fine. That may make you feel better, but not for them. Do be there when, uh, when they need you. There was a woman who lost her husband, and she was at home. She was so distraught, she could not talk. A friend came by and stayed with her, but they didn't talk. The friend sat there with her for an hour, but not a word was exchanged, and finally the friend had to leave. And when she got up to leave, the poor lady stood up and told how, her, how comforting it was and how grateful she was that she came. Thank you. Sometimes just your presence. It's not what you say. You, you want to say something. You, 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 you want to have an Oprah moment and say something profound. And the words, there's no words. We had one of our detectives uh, for the state police shot a, uh, a few years ago. He was, they were delivering a warrant to a murder suspect and, or a, a search warrant. They wanted to search the home. And, and he shot the detective with a, um, um, a high caliber rifle hit him in the clavicle, and then the bullet broke the clavicle and then went down and went cl very close to the heart, did a lot of damage, and he was in very bad shape, lost a lot of blood. They had rushed him to the hospital. I got the call that there was, you know, a troop at the hospital, and so I immediately got in the car and went to the hospital as the chaplain and, and went, was immediately let back. They saw my badge, who knew who I was, let me back in the back, and it was just chaos and mayhem with with all kinds of sheriff's deputies and local police and state troops. And uh, they're working on the detective and the emergency, and I was watching all of this and then praying, you know, just there praying and uh, trying to just be supported. And one of the sergeants later told me, he, in fact, the sergeant that drove him and met the, uh, met the ambulance, he told me later, he said, you know, I appreciated the fact that you came, he said, it was comforting. You know, sometimes that's your role, is just present. It's not what you're going to say. Be there. Give a hug. Giving hugs are, are not wrong. I, I, was taught, I was taught in Bible college. I'm not going to get this message finished, I know, so I'm just going to just going to do what I'm going to do here. Um, I was taught in Bible college that you practice the mafia rule in regard to women. You know what the mafia rule is? I'll keep your hands off. That's the mafia rule. I'll keep your hands off. And I have pretty much, I have practiced that. I don't, I don't, I don't hug the ladies, you know, I never have. But there has been occasions where I've been at a hospital bed with someone who is looking at their child in the bed. And I'm the, I'm the only one there, and the mother's the only one there, and they're watching their sick baby or their sick child. And I put an arm around their shoulders. There was a lady who, is, who was probably about my age now. I was, in my, I was in my 30s. And this lady just found out that she had terminal cancer, cancer she had gone into the hospital for an infected toe. They took blood work because they were going to do some surgery on this and found something, an abnormality. They did some more tests and found out that she, in, in the two lobes of her liver, one half was entirely eaten away with cancer, and the other half was like a half gone, or it was more than a half gone. It, she was... She found out when she went in for a simple surgery that her life was in danger, that she was going to die. And she was in a, in a uh, hospital that was significantly far from our little town in Vernon. 
And so I, I had gone to call on her, and her family had not been there much. She had three adult children. Uh, uh, they did not come. And I, I remember walking into that room and her sitting on the edge of her bed, shoulders bent forward, her head down. And it was, I remember that to this day. It was one of the saddest, saddest scenes of here this person is all alone dealing with this illness. And I did something that I would probably have never done. I sat down beside her on the bed and put my arms around her. And I didn't say a thing. We just sat there. Now, you wonder, well, should you have done that? What if somebody had walked in? You know what? It, I, I didn't care at that point. That person, that person needed comfort. And sometimes you just need to give somebody a hug and, uh, and take care of them. I had, I, there was a, a deputy at the jail I was the chaplain of many, many years ago, and he, he had this massive coronary. He survived it, but his heart was like barely there. And he, I, but I was called to the house of this, this jailer. He was in critical condition. And he did recover for a while, but then he died not long after that. And his widow was there, and I, but I had gotten to know her. Um, I went to the viewing uh, for the funeral, and um, she saw me. Oh, it didn't, she didn't run, but she came, made a beeline, and she took me by the hand. She, we were holding hands. And she took me up to, to the casket where he was laid out there at the casket. And I felt a little odd standing up there, and, and the place was filled with people, standing up there holding hands with this woman. But I thought to myself, you know what? Anybody who would think anything doesn't matter. This, need, this woman needed me to ha hold on to her hand in this critical moment in her life. So you acknowledge their pain. You empathize, empath empathize and you sympathize, and you acknowledge their pain. It's okay to tell them you're really I, what, you're you're going through a really tough time right now. It's okay to acknowledge their pain, I or just say I know how much you love them, and tell them that you're thinking about them and check in with them weeks or months afterwards. Talk to them about their loved one that's passed away if it's been a death in the family. You know what some what people who have lost loved ones said they say no one will bring up their loved one, no one will talk to them about it. Because they're afraid that if they do, that it's going to make this person sad. And what the effect of it is, is that, that they're acting like the person they love most in life is forgotten by everybody else. Tell stories about the person. You might think it's going to upset them. In most cases, no. It'll show them that you're thinking about them. And do let them know that you're thinking about them. A phone call, a visit, a meal, a service. Be appropriate. Be appropriate. I'm sorry for your loss. If you don't know whatever else to say, anything else to say, say that. I'm sorry for your loss. How are you holding up is good. I'm here for you if you need anything. Don't just say that, though. Maybe come with a meal. Maybe come and walk their dogs if they've got, you know. I mean, come mow their lawn. And just say, and show up with your mower, you know. And if you don't know what to say, you say, you know, I don't know what to say. I wish I had the right words for you. You can say that. And they'll understand and they'll appreciate it. So you, I know everybody wants to say something inspirational, right? I mean, you want to say something that's going to alleviate the hurt. They are going to hurt. Nothing's going to change that. But... You can't avoid doing something or saying something that's going to make it worse for them. And you can do that which is going to be a comfort to them. Make it known that you've not forgotten them and that you care for them. All right. We're going to stop there, and uh, maybe we'll pick up these other ones uh, here uh, next time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we know that this world is a world that has a lot of sorrow and a lot of sadness, and none of us are going to escape that. All of
of us are going to, at one time or another, in some way, shape, or form, encounter a heavy heart. But help us to be mindful of the, of the hurting of others. Help us to remember um, and to be sensitive and to be empathetic and sympathetic to the hurting of others. Help us not to minimize their pain or try to just tell them to be strong and to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Help us to be the people that are holding them up. Give us a sensitive, compassionate heart as your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name.